It's a very long story. My parents were alcoholics and were in and out of prison. It was a pretty violent situation. Like, I felt like my life was in danger, you know? Like, the abuse was getting worse and worse. Me and my stepfather wasn't getting along, so basically my mother allowed him to put me out. My mother was, uh, you know, growing up, she was a hardcore um, heroin addict. My mom uh, asked me to leave because I um, had a baby. It was too much for her. I was in the Covenant house with my mom when I was two. I was homeless since I was 14. I was in and out of the shelters, um, on the streets, off and on for almost two years. I'm not going back there. I refuse to. I didn't have a home. Uh, my mother was an addict. That living space was pretty much a drug facility. So it all kind of came to a head when my mother stabbed me, and I ran away from home. And uh, after about six months of being in the streets, I found Covenant House. We did have some really rough time. She never told me what it was. She always told me that, you know, we were staying in a hotel. I didn't know any better. I thought it was a really nice hotel. And I didn't have anywhere else to go, and I'd heard about Covenant House, so I um, came here for safety, basically. It and I was bouncing from house to house, but it wasn't until I was 20, and I've been here ever since, and they've helped me with so much so far. Having everybody in your life kind of turning their back on you and, and you realize that you're on your own now. My experience at Covenant House changed me as a person because I knew while I was still skeptical of people, I knew that there was a chance that not everyone was out to get me. And, uh, you know, it made me feel hope for the first time. I remember, like, the weirdest things, like painting some guy's nails with, like, highlighter and running around with, like, a really good friend of mine. The staff here were so welcoming and warming, and they reassure you to make you feel like, you know, everything is going to be OK. They help you with everything. It was helpful, like it felt okay, it felt safe. Like I didn't feel like oh, I have to worry about, you know, like what's gonna happen here. I didn't, I didn't get that feeling. At the time I was considering switching jobs to other things and uh, they really kind of helped me to stay on track of what I needed to get done. They're there for me through everything and they help and they've been there. I'm able to go to them whenever I have an issue. Although that seems like minimal to other people, that meant a lot to me, you know, somebody's looking out for me. You know, it's, it's just me, like, I, I don't have no kids and, you know, I don't have, like, a family or anything, so it's just just to know that you have people out there just, look, you know, looking up to you and, and you're something positive to somebody, it's a good feeling. Through anything that, any situation that came up while I was here, that was one thing that the staff definitely pressed upon was always keep looking forward, always keep going towards what you're trying to accomplish, which is stability and um, housing. The bad things in life give me strength because, like, I had so much of it. And when you have a surplus of something, it's so wasteful to just let it sit there or to let it just go to waste. It molded me into the person that I am today. Like, I'm very appreciative for what I've had. And I was able to pass that down to my children. I think that going through a lot, like, as a little kid, does change your perspective. I don't think people believe that little kids remember everything. But I know what it's like to see my mom cry and to see her hurt because she felt like she couldn't give me everything, but, yeah. Yeah, I think about Covenant House every day because without Covenant House, like, where would I be? I wouldn't have had that, like, stepping stone. I wouldn't have had that place to kind of, like, gather myself and pick up my pieces and put myself back together. I want my son to have every opportunity possible for him, you know, not, and, you know, not to feel neglect, not to feel hurt, not to feel like his mother or father aren't there for him. Um, I want him to always know that he has his parents there for him. Covenant House. My dearest Covenant House. Words cannot explain how much you mean to me. It is all thanks to the Covenant House that I have this day. In a time of desolation and despair, you were a helping hand, an anchor, and a friend. The shelter you provided gave me warmth. The food you fed me gave me nourishment. 
and your love gave me hope. Thank you so much for giving me a chance all those years ago to replant my roots and leave my past behind. You are a constant reminder to me that there are great people out there who genuinely cares, and for that, I will forever thank you. I love you all and appreciate your continued work and efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I honestly just want to say thank you because my mom wouldn't be where she is without the help that she got when she was 16, so thank you. Thank you all for joining us tonight <clears throat> for a conversation around human trafficking and the work that we all can do together to fight human trafficking and the exploitation of young people. So Covenant House, as some of you might know, works in 31 cities in six countries, in the United States, in Canada, Mexico, Honduras, Guatemala, and Nicaragua. And many of the young people who we work with more than 2,000 sleeping under a Covenant House roof tonight are survivors of human trafficking. That's language we use now. The problem's not new. We just had different language for it when I started at Covenant House back in 1992. So I was a lot thinner, had a lot more hair. First young person that I met on September 7th, 1992, Binny, came in and told me the story of never, never knowing her father losing her mom when she was 13 years old. She was immediately disenrolled from school and she was turned over to her mother's sister who essentially had her doing all the chores. And by the time she was 15, she was turned over to a local gang. And back then we said that she was prostituted. Today we would say that she was trafficked. It was a parade of self-absorbed, loveless Johns who commodified and exploited her, and this was her life, night after night after night, until she escaped and made her way to JFK. A couple of Port Authority cops noticed her, approached her. She was eating out of a trash can. She was wearing the same clothes. She smelled. They knew something was amiss. It's probably hard for some of the students in the room to believe that a young person could live in an airport for a week and not be noticed, but in the post 9-11 world, things are different. Pre-9-11, young people were hanging out in airports all the time, the way that they do now in subway stations or in bus terminals or in all-night donut shops. They brought her to Covenant House, which was then and still is the country's biggest center for young people who are facing homelessness. And I had just graduated from law school. I graduated with all the arrogance and none of the skill that law school is supposed to give you, had no idea what to do. And I couldn't even tell you what color her eyes were for the first half hour because she averted her gaze to the floor and her cheeks were just soaked with tears. And she told me the story of her aunt running up all this debt. It turned out she had $150,000 worth of debt that she was worried was coming her way. It was stupid stuff. It was Tupperware, it was a used car. She was very far behind in school. She was struggling in school at the time that her mom died. She was not a strong reader. Now she had missed eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, and she was really worried about whether she would be able to get back into school, let alone whether she could get a high school diploma. And because the law back then was what the law was, she was also worried about being prosecuted with respect to the prostitution ring. And I walked her down to the 10th precinct I can remember this like it was yesterday. We walked into um, one of the conference rooms and the sergeant leaned over after Benny shared a little bit of her story and he said, do you mean to tell me that you are here confessing to being part of a prostitution ring in the city? And I realized that I had walked the first young person that Covenant House had asked me to take care of and care for into legal jeopardy. So I repeated something I heard on Law and & Order. I said, interview over. And we walked out. And we found our way together. More importantly, she found her way. She today is, of course, <laughs> I'm skipping a lifetime of rallying, shining, aspiring, stretching, overcoming. But today she leads one of the largest neonatal units in New Jersey, taking care of other people's sick infants. She made her way through school. 
She found someone who loved her in the right way. They have a family together. She's a matriarch. And she is an activist and an advocate. The overcoming is absolutely possible. But the difference between 30 years ago and today is that the world has caught up to what this experience largely in the shadows of exploitation and degradation and disenfranchisement is about and has created new tools and new opportunities to try to penetrate this multi-billion dollar international criminal conspiracy to buy and sell human beings. And the sad reality is that many of those young human beings walk through the door of our covenant houses, or in Latin America, they're referred to as Casa Alianza and La Alianza every day. But to be people of hope, we can point to story after story after story of young people who have overcome. And my colleagues who are here with me today are gurus in the overcoming. They are among Covenant House's most treasured experts in fighting human trafficking, both from a public policy perspective and in working on the front lines with young people who are trying to reclaim their lives. It's my pleasure to introduce the first of them and she will introduce um, the second of them. Jane Beagleson and I go back to 1994. She looks the same, I don't get this. She looks exactly like she looked when I met her in the summer of 1994, and I look like I have spent the entire 30 years eating Hostess Twinkies. I don't understand what happened here, but Jane back then was in her first year at Harvard Law School, and I was a young lawyer, and we worked together building a legal services program for young people at Covenant House. And Jane went on to have, after she graduated from law school, an extraordinary career as a public advocate and we reconnected um, a little bit over a decade ago when she was working for Mayor Bloomberg in a, in a leadership role in a task force that um, he had crafted to address human trafficking in New York City. And with a little bit of convincing, Jane joined Covenant House and is at the helm of the advocacy work that we do, but also plays a critical role in the practice modernization work and in the research work we do to help young people move from the shadows and into the light. And among the important things that Jane does is speak truth to power. She'll talk more about this, I'm sure, but very recently in a really heated DC City Council meeting on human trafficking with lots of people shouting and criticizing Jane Jane once again lifted up the truth, the truth of what it is like for young people to be bought and to be sold. She remains one of the most courageous and authentic voices on behalf of human trafficking survivors because she is a great listener, because she listens to young people and then she amplifies their voices. It's my pleasure to welcome her tonight. Jane. Thank you so much, Kevin. That was so nice. Um, I will say we were back in 1994, what, 24 and 27? Something like Something that. Something like that. Um, and I, I still remember, I was telling Kevin in the car ride over that I have the letter where he actually gave me, a, uh, offered me the internship to work at Covenant House and I've saved it for all of these years. Um, and I really think that was one of the best things to happen in my life, to work at Covenant House. I will remember that summer forever. Um, first, we had a lot of fun, but he had gathered a group of law students from around the country, um, and it just, I knew from that internship that one day I was gonna work at Covenant House again. Um, I didn't realize it was gonna take, what, 20 years or so to come back, but I, I knew that I was gonna work at Covenant House again. Um, should I talk a little bit about me? Should I go ahead and just introduce, why don't I introduce Fabiola first? I think you should introduce Fabiola and then talk a little bit about yourself, and then I'll start grilling the two okay, of you. Okay, that's perfect. It's hard to introduce Fabiola other than to say that I have been blessed to work with her every day for the last five years. Um, it is hard work that we're doing. Um, it's, it's wonderful, joyous work, but it's also very emotional. And to be able to do it with people that I truly love by my side um, makes, it just makes it so much easier and a joy to go to work every day. So I'm blessed to work with this woman who directs our anti-human trafficking program at Covenant House. Um, she's an amazing clinician. She's who I'd wanna be if I actually had been a 
clinician instead of a lawyer, which is really what I truly did want to be. Um, and she is an amazing clinician, teaches at several, several graduate social school work programs, including NYU. And she's done anti-human trafficking work in Haiti, Malawi, um, and here in New York City with us at Covenant House. Um, I'm amazed every day with how the young people relate with her, how she can get a young person who's afraid, um, scared, does not trust anyone to open up to her. Um, and frequently, Fabiola is the first person that they tell these stories of rape and exploitation. Um, so I'm just honored to work with you. Thank you, Jane, and thank you, Kevin, for just having me come out tonight, and thank you to St. John's. What I will say is I cannot promise I can do this conversation tonight without crying. Well. I already started with the video. Um, as Jane pointed to, this work is so emotional, but having people who get it and who go fight for what we do and the voices of the victim has been such a privilege, and for me, every day has been I think someone earlier asked me, how did I end up here? And I always said, well, I thought I was gonna be a fashion designer. That was always, you know, I was making clothes and jewelry as a eight year old, I remember it vividly. And somehow life happened. I think God, life, however you understand it, has a way of putting you exactly where you need to be. And even in then, I still am able to use my jewelry and my making stuff and creating stuff as a way to reach young people. So I've been just equally privileged in doing this work. So thank you both, and thank you, St. John's, for having us tonight. Well, let me ask the Thank you. So let's start by having a shared understanding of what trafficking is. What, what is human trafficking? Well, no, I, I hate to do this a little, because it's a little legally, but um, so I hate to be the boring lawyer on the stage, but I do think it's really important just to have a shared understanding of what, what trafficking is. And I do think the public's understanding of what trafficking is is different from what the law is. So I'll, I'll do it as clearly and as quickly as I can. But under US federal law, we'll talk about sex trafficking first. For tra to have trafficking, you need a commercial sex act. So that's trading sex for something of value. It could be, usually we think of money, but it could be drugs, it could be food. For our young people, a lot of times it's a place to stay. So we have a commercial sex act exchanged for something of value. Now, what is the difference, though, between prostitution and trafficking? Under federal law, the difference is that for it to be trafficking, there has to be some degree of force, fraud, or coercion. So in some way, it's against the person's consent. Um, it's important to keep in mind, though, that you can consent at one moment, but if at any moment you don't want to be doing this and someone is forcing you, you're now a victim of trafficking. So we see this all the time at Covenant House. We'll have an 18-year-old who's desperate and feels like they have no choice but to trade sex for something of value, often a place to sleep. They might do it consensually at first, but if at any moment they don't wanna do it and they have a pimp who says, if you don't do this, I'm gonna beat, beat you up or I'm gonna hurt your family, they're now a victim of human trafficking. So you don't need any like crossing of borders, you don't need any locked up in cages, just at any moment, someone is being forced to sell sex. Also, the federal government was smart enough to understand that someone under the age of 18 cannot consent to selling their body. So there is no such thing as a child prostitute, right? If someone, if there's a child who's trading sex for money, they are a victim of human trafficking. Um, so I think that's, that's important to understand. And there's also labor trafficking, very similar to sex trafficking, um, but instead of a commercial sex act, someone is forcing them to work against their will. Again, you need force, fraud, or coercion, and this time there's not an age. You know, No matter what the age, you have to show force, fraud, or coercion. And then one last point, at Covenant House, we don't care if the young person meets that federal definition. We will work with anybody who has worked in commercial sex. We're not gonna say, well, they didn't experience force. Anyone who's been in the life of prostitution or Jane, commercial sex, old. yeah. Anyone who's been in the life of commercial uh, sex or prostitution is someone that we will help. So Fabiola, you know that whether it's Hollywood or Anchorage or here in New York City, Covenant House serves a, a very large number of young people who have survived human trafficking. Why do you think it is that young people who face homelessness seem to be especially susceptible to exploitation and human trafficking? 
Well, part of that is there's a few things to, to consider and look at. One of them is when we're thinking about trafficking, we've got to think of all the systems in place and all the systems that a young, vulnerable person is either entering, has access to, or has been through. And what I mean by that is foster care, child welfare, education system. So all of those lackings or insufficient support are in, within those systems, including the family system and, and family dynamics and struggles there, increase the vulnerabilities of a young person who becomes homeless. So what pimps, and when I say pimps, they're exploiters, which could be male or female. What they're looking for is a young person who has gone through all of these systems and have vulnerabilities, that they've been in foster care, they've had a failed adoption um, process, they've been kicked out, maybe because they've gotten pregnant, as we saw in the video, they've come out to their family, the family itself has had substance issues, mental health, some kind of breakdown in the family structure that the homeostasis within the family has, has shifted creates vulnerabilities. So the, the, the explorers are not looking for, for the college student who has a family, support, some professors to, that, that can come for them, look for them, advocate for them. They're looking for the young person. Is if they go missing, no one's gonna even notice that they're gone. The young person who has either um, a mental health diagnosis that has gone untreated or that has a mental health diagnosis with clear sim that's very symptomatic. They're also looking for the young person who might be using uh, marijuana, let's say, or other substances as a way to cope with the trauma that they experience. They're particularly also looking for young people whose the first point of entry of exploitation is not the exploiter themselves, but it, it, it might have been sexual abuse. So what we see in the work and, and, and in, to the vulnerabilities is the first point of entry is not when that pimp says, go do this with this number of people, but it's the uncle, the father, the neighbor, the whomever that exploited that young person through, um, for, through rape or any kind of sexual molestation. That shifts a young person's life, their boundaries, their sense of self, how they see the world, trust, and that becomes a, a, a cesspool for risk factors and red flags. If I could, if, if I could just add to that, I mean, Fabiola got that exactly right. They're looking for people with vulnerabilities, and that's one. What Fabiola said, they're not. It's not going to be like the movie Taken, where they have a father who's going to hunt them down. Nobody's going to look for them. But also, the more vulnerability someone has, the easier they are to control. Right? So they don't have to lock them up like you see in the movies because they're controlling them psychologically. Right? If, if a young person has never had like, parental love, right? I, I, I said this earlier, but there was um, one, I remember this vividly, one young person told me that the first person to ever give her a hug was her pimp. Another told me the first person to ever give her a birthday cake was a pimp. So. It's very more similar to domestic violence, where one day they're offering pretend affection, pretend family, pretend care, and the next day they're threatening or beating them up. But it's a lot easier to manipulate someone who's got these vulnerabilities so that they don't have to lock them up. A lot of our clients don't think they're victims. They think they're in love with their pimp or their they call it their daddy. Yeah. Sometimes the, the explorer of the pimp is a boyfriend. So it started out as a relationship, and then they build up to that. I mean, how does a teenager even become homeless? Uh -huh. I can't even believe I'm asking these questions, because you know I know the answers <laughs> yeah. to these questions. But uh, I'm trying to set this up so that folks here who probably don't live in a universe like we live in this universe of young people walking in the front door every day, desperate for a meal, um, Offer us some context, like how do teenagers become homeless? How does that happen? Why does that happen? Well, I, I, I'm gonna reference the video because I started crying immediately. I cannot watch that video without, or any of these videos without crying. So 17 year old, 16 year old finds herself pregnant, however that happened, goes to her family and says, I'm pregnant, I need support. Mom says, I cannot feed another mouth, go figure it out, I'm kicking you out. She's on the street. The boyfriend might have been a little bit older. That's what we typically see. Let's say he's a 26-year-old. She finds out mm, he was married. He has three other kids. And he's like, I don't know what, I, 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 this has nothing to do with me. Go figure it out. So she's now 17, 16, 17, pregnant, maybe haven't, most likely haven't finished school, does not have a driver's license, doesn't know what to do. Someone is going to offer her something. 
And that something could be a friend who might have stayed at Covenant House and said, why don't you go to Covenant House? Or in trying to avoid sleeping on the train, sleeping in alleyways, or staying on a friend's couch. Well, let me go back a little. She has stayed at a friend's couch. A couple of friends invited her over. She stayed there for a week, over here for two weeks. And then the friend says, I can't keep you here any longer. My, mom, my mother needs you out. You've got to go. So now she's a month in, not home, pregnant, belly's growing. She's got to figure out what she's going to do. What is her next step? Then there's you know, another 20-something-year-old man comes and said, well, I can offer you a nice stay in a hotel. Why don't I pay for you for the hotel? And a nice meal. You know what? I'll take you to Red Lobster. Better yet, I'll also take you to Victoria's Secret. Oh, how about Forever, Forever, Forever 21? What else do you need? You need some new pairs of sneakers? I got that too. So that explorer probably has spent, in a matter of hours, anywhere between three to five hundred dollars. This is someone who's desperate, vulnerable, she's got a place to stay, she's been fed, there's a, there's a relief in, I don't have to think about my desperateness and my situation tonight. What do you think is gonna happen? That 26-year-old exploiter has her in. He has her in. And now, whatever happens in that hotel the next time, the next day, she may find herself, if she's lucky enough, at our front door. If not, maybe Port Authority, who's close to us, who we partner with, may see her and think, something's off you. I have a 16-year-old. She kind of looks pregnant. She looks desperate. She hasn't bathed. Something's going on and might bring her to the door. So there's a variety. This is one of the ways in which a young person can become pregnant, I mean, can become homeless. What it is is when there's no support. There is no family to say, I'm going to take you in. And yes, this is not maybe the best choice, but we're going to figure this out. What is your next step? Let's figure that out together. When there is an absence of that, homelessness, amongst everything else we'll talk about tonight, becomes, is what becomes available for exploiters to, um, to feed on. And I'll just add other ways to that's a perfect example of how a young person can become homeless. But there are others. A lot of our young people are LGBTQIA. If they come out to their parent, they might be kicked out. Um, additionally, a lot of our young people have been through the child welfare system. They sign themselves out of foster care at 18. Technically, they can stay till 21, but most of our young people have not had good experiences in foster care. So they think, oh, I'm 18. I can sign myself out. I've got a friend's house I can couch I can sleep on, I'm gonna get a job. Well, sure enough, they get into a fight with that friend, and then they go to another friend. They get in a fight with that friend, they go to another friend, so they're couch surfing, and then they end up with us. A lot of our young people have also been physically and sexually abused at home. Um, a lot of our young people have parents who are on drugs or also in shelters, so there's all sorts of ways that our young people can find themselves homeless. And I would add, I mean, a lot of you in this room, I think, are college age. So the, the young people that we're seeing are between the ages of 18 and 24. Technically, you're an adult at 18. But if you think about it, if you're 18 and you have no one to give you any financial support or any emotional support, nothing, um, 18 is, is really young to be completely on your own. So our young people do not have families who are gonna be there for them. And that's where we hope that a place like Covenant House will be there for them before they get into the path of an exploiter. If I may add, also on the clinical level, a lot of the young people find themselves homeless because their mental health symptoms show up in their homes in ways that their families or foster parent is not able to manage, right? So they may have bipolar, they may have ADHD, they may have onset schizophrenia or whatever else, or depression, major depression disorders, and their symptoms have become unmanageable for both the young person and the family, and they find themselves outside of the home um, in seek of refuge or whatever. So we're seeing that a lot of the times as well, where mom says or aunt says or grandma says, I can't deal with you, I can't deal with this behavior, you need to go. So we, we know that it's not as simple as a young person coming in the front door of Covenant House and magically they're free and it's all better. We've talked about the fact that, for example, in Western Canada, Covenant House Vancouver deals with the Hells Angels gang dropping young women off when they start their period. And those young women will stay at Covenant House for four, five, six, seven days, and when their period ends, the gang will come and get them. And 
it raises, I think, the question, why would a young woman freed from that experience go back? Trauma bond. <laughs> Trauma bond. So, uh, you know, again, as Jane was mentioning, so if, if the exploiter, the pimp, See, pimps are really smart. I always say, I, 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 it's almost like they've go, they, they've attended some kind, and I, and I'm not, and I don't want to be sound offensive, but it's almost as if they've gone to social work school or any of the psychological trainings where you learn how to assess and how to probe, right? That's what you get trained on. Um, at least it's what I'm trained on as a social worker and as a clinician is how do you assess. Um, how do you ask questions open? And so pimps are very smart, and they use a lot of the skills that we would use in the helping profession to assess a client for the purpose of services and for help. But they're doing it for, for, for the opposite. So they, they are offering the young people or victims um, things that they don't have. And sometimes, a lot of times, it comes with love. I've had young people who tell me that the pimp never beat me unless I didn't bring X number in. Or he would not hurt me, like he buys my clothes, I have a place to stay, I, I'd rather be the, where he's putting me instead of being on the street or on the trains. He, he protects me from other pimps, from other pimps, because you know pimps fight with amongst themselves about their girls, right? They call them saddles. Um, so, they're providing something for that young person that becomes so psychologically entrenched that it becomes very difficult to leave. Again, it's very similar to the DV cycle, where that person is both the perpetrator, but is also the Romeo. There's also the cycle of, of how um, pimps train and, 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 and get a girl to, to be ready to put her out on the track, or however he, um, he engages her in sex work. Um, he he starts out as the Romeo. He's sweet, he's loving, he's giving, he's attentive, he listens to her. He presents as a very mature older man. And again, if we're talking about a young woman and a young, or a young man who did not have that at home, who would, raise your hand if you would not want someone that is attentive to you, that would listen to you, that presents, they care about your future. We have had pimps that have registered girls into their GED programs. We've had pimps who put girls, pick them up at school, and at night bring them to their hotels to have sex with 50 men. I mean, we have pimps who really work to be a daddy and a provider in the ways that we, we all know it to be. But it, the conjunction of that is then they're also are also the, the, the giver of the trauma and of the abuse that, that occurs. I, th I think it would be helpful if you talked a little bit about the ways in which pimps recruit young people. Um, I don't want to prompt more than that. I have a couple of ideas, but why don't you talk a little bit about your experience, Jane, with probably the better known example of um, a digital platform, and maybe Fabiola, you could talk about um, you know, sending in recruits. I mean, I would also say just again, they're looking for vulnerable people. So there was a time where I knew where every pimp was in Times Square because the young people told me. And they hang out outside of Port Authority, although the police there are very good, but they still hang out outside of Port Authority. They hang out outside of the Dollar Pizza Shop. Yep. And they say things like, you want me to buy you some food, beautiful? Or um, they even tell them they lie. They're like, if they see them on the way to Covenant House, they say, you know, the cove is full. Where are you going to go? Why don't you go with me? And we're not full, right? They're, they're just, they're such manipulated, manipulative, brazen abusers. They wait outside of foster care group homes. They congregate wherever vulnerable youth are. So one of the, the examples Kevin is referring to, this is how brazen one of them was. I was so angry. He put out an ad in Craigslist that said, so you live at the Cove? You want to make more money? And there were dollar signs all over it. Made us all so furious because here we are trying to help these young people, and it's because we're trying to help them that these people are preying on them. So I turned to a good friend in the Manhattan DA's office, and thankfully he did an investigation. He wouldn't tell me any of the details. I don't know how it worked. But he assured me for months, he said, Jane, I'm on this. And sure enough, I think it took almost a year. But a year later, there was a trial. I had to testify. It was scary. 
Um, but the person is in jail for about 10 to 15 years. But that example just shows just how like brazen they are and how, again, they're not going after, you know, the, they're going after the most vulnerable people. My, my niece was going to Europe, who she's about you guys' age, and my sister was like, oh my gosh, she was going alone, she's gonna get sex trafficked. I'm like, no, no she's not. They're looking for people who they know are vulnerable and can be manip manipulated. Yeah, you know, the other ways that recruitment shows up is sometimes the victim themselves are doing the recruitment. The pimp sends them to Covenant House to bring other girls with them. So they would use Covenant House as a, so they would come as a youth in need of shelter. They would come in, but their objective is to leave with as many girls as they can that they would bring back to the pimp, back to the exploiter. Um, and it's, it, I mean, I, uh, it, 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 it makes you feel so defeated sometimes because what now we're dealing with is the victim that is also part perpetrator, but we know that that victim that's doing the recruiting is a victim. However, we cannot put the whole community at risk, right? So it's, it's engaging the, the victim slash recruiter and saying, we know that this is happening. You know, we have policies um, on site about recruitment that here's numbers, this is you can still stay in touch with us if you're ready to you know, like do something different, maybe if you don't wanna go here, other shelters, but still planting the seed of relationship with them so that they do come back. We actually had an example of that. I'll share it with you all. So we have a safe house in Long Island um, that we, we, we developed with our partnership um, with two other organizations. And during the early times when we first started, we work with a lot of other organizations that works with um, trafficking youth, trafficked youth, and one of them is GEMS. So GEMS had reached out to us. Um, they had a young woman that they were working with for many years who was doing very well, but she did not have a place to stay. She needed um, a program like we had at the Safe House that would support her professional, educational, and emotional development. So we interviewed her, I did the assessment. I always remember, Vividly, she had on, she had worked the night before. I th no, yep, she had worked the night before. I didn't know this until she was leaving the program and she said, by the way, I had worked the night before. I said, oh, okay. But she, she had on some clothes that I thought, how am I gonna get on the Long Island Railroad with this girl? She's an African American and I know in terms of stigma, like what people are gonna think exactly that. So those are all the things that we think about. So I said, well, why don't we try to find something else? So we went to the store nearby at Port Authority. I got some petty cash. I bought her some new clothes. I'm like, just buy some pants. Let's put some pants on. Um, she put some pants on. We go off, and um, she gets into the house. The, our partners, which are the Oblate sisters, they love her. You know, we all are in agreement that we want to bring her in. So she moved in. She's doing well. She's pursuing her GED. She, at that time, had been um, substance-free. She's been stable. And then she meets up or ran into an old friend um, from when she was in the life who said, come to a party that her ex-pimp was um, doing in Harlem where she um, was trafficked a lot, not originally from Harlem. She ends up and then says to bring a friend, some like bring another person with you. She um, brings another girl that's from the house with her. And then we find out that she was drugged, raped, locked up in the closet, physically abused. The pimp beat her because she's been gone for three months, which was the three months she was living at the safe house. And then the girl who she took to the party, came. she came back and reported this. So we had a very hard decision to make. We were heartbroken because she was doing so well. Um, we had to let her go. We had to discharge her from the safe house because she put the community and this other young woman um, in danger. Um, we did discharge her, um, but part of the conversation we had with her in collaboration with Jim's was to say, we are still here when you are truly ready. In whatever stage that is, we will support you. You can call us back. But we also gave her some recommendations. And some of that was um, to get substance use treatment, to enter into therapy, which she did, and really make a commitment to staying out of the life, the life of prostitution. And that included um, her getting a restraining order, 
against the exploiter, not um, meeting with old girls, old other girls that she had worked with on the track, and kind of really making a decision to avoid that old community because it's an easy return to for victims. And she said, I promise I'm gonna come back, Fabiola, and I will show you, and you'll be proud. So she did, she was out for about two months, and she did call us up, and she said, I've been clean for the last two months. I have not, she was staying with a friend. Um, she had not been in touch with her pimp. And let me, add, let me add that. So one of the things the pimp did with her is, he, so he connected her to his mother and his sister that she bonded with. So they were her support, but her support was also connected to the pimp. And that was one of the ways he controlled her. Um, so she had, for those two months, not go to what at the time was home for her, which was his mother and his sister. Um, she did come back to the house. We planned with her of what we expected and what we needed in ways that we can support her. Not only did she thrive, she still is doing very well. She got her GED. She became a CNA certified nursing assistant. She also had the certification in culinary because she was interested in that. She was a fellow for um, GEMS. She became a leader in the house. She um, continued therapy this after um, we had asked her to, to, to go into therapy. She remained clean up until she stayed in the program 18 months after. Um, which is the length of stay in our program. And then she reconnected with her family in Virginia, where she was uh, originally from, got herself her own apartment, saved money, found herself a job, and has been clean and sustained herself since. So this is not, I mean, I'm saying it in like, what, two minutes? This is a three-year process um, with a lot of tears, a lot of pain, a lot of collaborate, a lot of back and forth, but to do this work, you've got to stay the course. I remind myself of that story every time I'm devastated, because they frequently do go back because of the trauma bondage, just like domestic violence. I think in domestic violence, they say it takes seven times to leave, so it's the same thing. So every time, it just happened about a month ago, um, a client, this was a fairly old client we worked with many years ago, but one, someone we're working with right now, um, Natalie, one of our coworkers, came in my office crying about a month ago because we had a client who's thriving, like doing advocacy work with us, doing so well, and she told her in a therapy session, um, I feel worthless because I'm not pretty. Um, and I'm gonna go back to taking dates, which is like a euphemism for going back to prostitution, um, because I need to get like a breast, my breast and butt done. And we were just devastated. Um, but it, it, the psychological of the years of being told by her pimp that she's not pretty and she's worthless. Um, and we kept trying to tell her, but there's so many worthwhile things you can do. She's like, no, I mean, there's just no use for me being on this planet if I'm not pretty. Um, so both Natalie and I were, were in tears, and I had to remind me the reason kind of out of the blue this came to me just because I think of that story every time I am so frustrated about that decision to go back. I will say that about last week or two weeks ago, um, Natalie, the, the social worker, did such good work with her that the young woman on her own um, came to the decision that this is not what she wanted to do. But you know what? That's a success, but that's a success for now. Two weeks later, she could go back. It's, yeah. it's, it takes yeah. a year or two before someone is fully out of the life. And this young woman is a fellow in our program, so we have a, a a grant from Hilton Foundation that helps us do um, survivor leadership um, opportunities for our victims. So she is a fellow, right? And she also completed not just CNA, CNA phlebotomy. I mean, she's medical tech assistant, so she's really interested in entering the field. I mean, this is a woman who is thriving professionally, vocationally, and academically, but still feels worthless. Because um, from, for those of you in, in, the, in the audience that are studying psychology or interested in the field, the, the trauma is so embedded in who they are and how they see themselves, it's almost as if nothing she accomplishes that are, uh, that are amazing is enough. You, you mentioned, Fabiola, a safe house, um, which we don't talk about very much at Covenant House. Most people, when they think about Covenant House, will think about um, here in the city, you'll think about our program that's by the Lincoln Tunnel, the, 
the shelter where young people first come in. But the safe house is something altogether different, and the two of you um, started this. We have safe houses, of course, in Toronto in the United States um, and in Latin America. Maybe you could talk a little bit with folks about what is a Covenant House safe house, and why doesn't Covenant House talk about that more? Well, the safe house is not just a safe house. It's really an opportunity for the young women we work with to have an experience of what a home should have been like. Um, it's a place where they are living in community with each other, and they've got to navigate what does it mean to share a space that's not about competition. Oftentimes, when they're prostituted by a pimp, the pimp will pin them against each other, and you know they're fighting for all stuff that really is, is futile. But the safe house provides an opportunity to heal, an opportunity to kind of rediscover, discover who they are, what their dreams or hopes are, and a space to just be in a, a place of laughter and be in a community where you can cook a meal. I mean, who would think that cooking a meal can mean so much for a trafficking victim, right? To be able to have that space where you can open your fridge, no one is controlling that, and you're cooking a meal for the first time, right? The, the act of providing in that way for yourself is so healing for so many of our survivors. The act of sitting at a table together with us, with each other, is so meaningful for them, right? So what we provide in the safe house is, yeah, we have all of the case management support, the social work support, the therapeutic support, but it's really them learning how to relive, um, traveling from Long Island to the city, navigating those kind of um, transportation, you know, New York City life, and not being controlled for the first time. That is healing. And, and those locations are locations that are, um, to the best of our ability, private. We aren't advertising um, that this is where young people um, or survivors are living. Talk a little bit about the other part of your work. So the front door of Covenant House, there's young people coming in. For the most part, they're hungry. They are lonely. They're facing homelessness. Some of them have been on the streets for just a day, but some of them have been on the streets for a long time. What's it like working with a young person right as they come in the front door trying to assess whether or not they have been exploited? So what we do, so it happens in different ways. So if they're coming in through from a referral from one of our partners, we know immediately, and one of us from the team would be downstairs at the intake. So they'll come in, there's security, and then they'll be funneled through the intake process where all the demographics information is gathered. But what we typically do when we know they're coming in, um, sometimes the DA's offices refer them gems, like restore, whatever, whoever, right? I'll go downstairs and I'm like, hi, I'm Fabiola. I'm happy to see you. Welcome. And they're like, who is this crazy woman? And why is she so happy, right? <laughs> um, and sometimes it depends. They would respond or not. But what I say to them is, once you're ready, I just want to get to know who you are and how we, and, and, and that's all I usually say. And I sit with them. I do a lot of listening. So I think a lot of the assessment, you know, we're trained to ask all these questions. I don't ask questions. I found for me, the questions I need answered will be answered once I develop, once I plant the seed of relationship building, right? So for me, it's I'm Fabiola. Part of what I do here is support young people who are homeless and who are exploited. I want to get to know you. So tell me about you. What brought you to our door? I might ask that sometime. And they start talking. And I will know within that talk what I need to know. I don't have to go back and say, so tell me, like, how, how old were you when you first exploited? What, what, what did your pimp look like? Like, who was your pimp? Is he looking for you? I don't have to ask those questions. And it's not the questions you want to ask when a young person comes to the, your door, desperate, homeless, tired, hungry. We want to know how they're doing. Other ways it happens is it's not always just me. There's also a lot of other staff that is greeting them, that is receiving them. So they know this is a place of safety and that we're here to get to know who they are but what they need for us to help them be their better selves. And I could talk a little bit about the screening tool because Fabiola just talked about when we know that they're a trafficking victim, but our young people don't walk in the door and say, help me, I've been trafficked. I've been there eight years, I've never heard that happen once, right? They say, I'm hungry, do you have any food? Do you have a bed? 
Um, and when I first got there over eight years ago, I, I looked into our data system trying to get a sense of how many trafficking survivors we had. And the number was very low. I think it was about five or six. And I knew that was wrong. Any case manager would, could point to X number of, of trafficked youth. But we were only asking one question on the intake form. And you know, we were, it's not that we were doing anything wrong. This is what every you know, homeless youth provider was doing. But we were asking a question on the intake form. Have you ever traded sex for food, drugs, or a place to stay? Well, if you're hungry and tired and want a bed, and you've got a stranger asking you questions, you're going to say no to that question. So we brought in Fordham University to help us come up with better questions to ask. So we do have this screening tool now. And a lot of it is about just making the lead-in non-judgmental. I mean, just if you just switch that question around a little bit and say, you know, a lot of times when a young person doesn't have family support and they're living on the street, sometimes they need to do whatever they need to do to survive. We know a lot of our young people, therefore, have to trade sex for da-da-da-da-da. Have you ever? You reframe that question, you get a lot larger numbers. Um, it doesn't mean more youth are trafficked, but we're doing a better job of identifying them. So now we do this screening tool for any positives, we send it to our anti-trafficking team. But I will say this, a, a screening tool, and this is important for those of you who are gonna go on to study psychology or sociology, there's this big push for evidence-based screening tools and all of that. That is good, I mean, this tool is a scientifically validated screening tool and it does help. But at the end of the day, if a young person isn't ready to disclose something, they're not gonna disclose. And I, I remember this vividly when we were piloting the tool, I asked one of our young people who I knew was a survivor of trafficking, did we forget any questions? And she said, lady, if I like you, I'm gonna tell you. If I don't like you, I'm not gonna tell you. It doesn't matter what questions you ask. She's like, and you're lucky I like you. Um, and I think that's so important because there is this movement now to make everything scientifically valid. And at the end of the day, I, I'm with Fabiola that so much of it is about relationship building. So that is why we don't rely just on this tool. We use the screening tool, but we get more of our referrals from training the staff. We train every single staff member, security guards, kitchen staff, the OBGYN, because sometimes they're not gonna open up to us, but they are gonna open up to the security guard at one o'clock in the morning. So we train the entire staff, and we get a lot of referrals that way. Well, Shanisha, one of our other team members, had an, we, she and I, you know, we worked with the team to develop the training. We did the training, I think, like one, Thursday or Friday afternoon, morning or whatever, and one of the kitchen staff was security, security guard. Security guard was in the training, you know. So we left for the day. I believe I think it was a weekend. And I think that Saturday, a young woman came in, and the security guard knew exactly what to ask because we're not there 24-7, right? So the security guard said, you know, if I had not gone through the training you provided, I would not have noticed, you know, like she seemed like, because she was worried, she was looking at her clock, she kept coming in and out. She was thinking that, the, I believe the pimp was outside looking for her, and she was afraid if she went out, like what would happen? So the security guard saw the red flags and engaged with her, and she disclosed, and then connect and told her, well, there's a whole team here, but for the weekend, they were able to put a plan in place of who can support her. Um, and then when we came back on Monday, she was put on the team. Another way they come through the door, Kevin, so they'll come through the regular intake, covenant house, and they, they say no to all the questions, even the screening tool, which doesn't get happened, which does not get asked at intake. And we may not know for months at a time. So they might be at covenant house for a week, for 30 days, um, and then we later find out that, oh, I'm a, I'm a victim, and that might be, they might share it with another staff, a residential staff, the lawyer, a social worker, the security guard, someone in the building, somehow there's another assessment we do that's called, a, um, it's now called, a, is it called Cuff Convo still? Um, where some of that gets out, where we get an assessment of the history. So a young person might be in our building, and we don't even know for weeks at a time that they've been trafficked. So we've gotta always, um, so we have to look at the different ways that, that we get to know if they are, in, that they're indicated and be ready to engage at any point once it's disclosed. We've got about eight minutes before we are gonna open this up for questions. Um, 
And there's three things I want to make sure we touch on. So this will be a supernova question, and then you figure out how you want to talk about this. The first is that Covenant House has a partnership with law enforcement in Anchorage. When the feds break up a trafficking ring, they work with Covenant House to create safe sanctuary for survivors. Same thing in Philadelphia when that happens. In Guatemala, we train the national police on identifying potential victims of trafficking and then bringing those victims to La Alianza. It'd be really interesting, I think, for you to talk about what your partnership is like with the Port Authority and other law enforcement collaborators here in the city. Second thing is um, we have talked a lot about, and I think understandably so, our work on the front lines with young people, but we also do a lot of advocacy work, both here in New York City, in New York State, and nationally, and I think it would be interesting for folks to hear a little bit about, one, why we do that, and what it is that we're advocating for, and then finally, saving maybe the most provocative piece of this for the end, we're unabashed in our advocacy for the Nordic model, and I think it would be helpful for you to talk a little bit about what the Nordic model is, why we are advocating for that across the country, um, and what the future looks like in terms of implementation of that. So collaboration with law enforcement and... Eight minutes. <laughs> well, you could filter it into uh, answers to questions five, from the audience, okay. too. I want to invite people to start thinking now about questions that you might have for my colleagues, because um, in about seven minutes now, we're going to ask <laughs> folks to um, ask those. Well, the collaboration is essential. You cannot do this work without partnering with others. Um, we don't provide every services a client or youth or a survivor may need. And it's important that just as we're building relationship with them, we're, we're modeling for them and teaching them and supporting them to build relationship with other service providers on other um, needs that they have. So that's very essential. We sit on many task forces. I particularly attend a lot of the Brooklyn Task Force meetings or work with the DA. Actually, just recently, just a few weeks ago, I was out of the office and then um, I left that they reached to the social worker, Natalie. We had, there's a young woman that they were bringing in who um, from Connecticut, she was trafficked predominantly in Connecticut but she's a witness in a high profile case in Brooklyn and working with the ADA. We thought she was gonna be leaving and then we were like all panicking and said, no, we've gotta like keep her here, she cannot be discharged. So we work col collaboratively with, um, with all of our, um, with all of the ADAs in, in, in the city. Jane and I um, have different direct contacts of people we can reach out to in law, law enforcement, particularly when it comes to having them sit with our young people. We, cause you know, we have to, understand that particularly young people of color do not have positive relationship with um, historically with police and with law enforcement. So part of our work is to support building new relationship with law enforcement, particularly when it has to do with supporting um, them around their victimization um, of trafficking. Um, so collaboration, and there's like a lot of people, both service providers, um, advocates. Jane do a lot of our advocating and lobbying, and she and I sometimes share that role. We also work with our funder, one of them is, a, is DOJ, and we go to a lot of their trainings. We recently, in the spring, did a um, training for DYCD, who is um, sort of a, a big institution here, and they called us to train their managers and deputy directors on how they can help their staff, particularly in after-school programs, um, be able to identify trafficking. Yeah, and I just real quick want to give the Port Authority police some props because I would say about 15 years ago, the norm was that police officers would arrest the person selling sex, the victim, and let the pimp and the client go free. And there really has been a lot of effort um, done to change that paradigm. And certainly the specially trained law enforcement, the Port Authority police now call me and say, hey, Jane, we noticed a young woman. Uh, we've spent weeks building a relationship with her. We're, she's now ready to go to Covenant House and they'll either bring her to us or we'll go get her. They're really doing a good job of understanding that those people selling sex are victims, which is a perfect segue to, to the Nordic model? Go for it. Okay, so I get really passionate about the Nordic models. I took my jacket off. Um, so the Nordic model is, uh, it started in, in Norwegian, Norway, Sweden. It's a model where law enforcement does not arrest someone selling sex because that person is usually exploited or a victim of some sort. But they continue to arrest 
those people buying sex and pimping sex. Um, there is a huge movement right now to fully decriminalize prostitution. Covenant House is against that because all of the, the reading and our day-to-day -day work has shown us that when you do that, you actually create more victims of human trafficking, right? It's if you allow more money in the system, there will be more reason for pimps and traffickers to recruit vulnerable people like our homeless youth. So we see no reason to allow more money into the hands of these pimps and traffickers and to allow them to get off scot-free. Instead, we believe this Nordic model, and I'm hoping that New York can pass it this legislative session. I know that's a little bit optimistic, but I'm hoping we could be the first state in the country that passes this Nordic model. Um, and there's a, it's a huge fight right now. There are people, again, who want to decriminalize everything. Covenant House, and I believe, and all of us believe, like, let's protect the people selling sex, let's get them services, not handcuffs, but why would we let the pimps and the traffickers off? We see what they do, we see how brutal they are. I believe the other side feels that you can really make a line between what's consensual and what's not. They want to keep consensual selling sex legal, uh, legal and criminalize just the trafficking. But in our work, we see that it is so hard to find that line. Our young people frequently come in and tell me that what they're doing is consensual, they want to do it, they enjoy it, and then that same youth six months later comes back to my office and says, you know what? I was doing it because I was being manipulated by my pimp or frequently a family member, my mother, and then they realize that they really were exploited. So that line between what is consensual and what is not is very difficult. But it just, we've seen how brutal and awful the pimps are. You just don't see any reason to get them off, like to let them off the hook. So instead, we're pushing this, this model with all of our advocacy partners and we're hoping for your support. Okay, I think we can at this point open the session up for questions from the audience. And I think there are St. John's students, staff, who are coming down the aisle now with microphones to make those available to those of you who may want to ask a question to Jane, Fabiola, or, or myself. While, while you're thinking of that, I want to say that Jane testified a couple of weeks ago in front of the D.C. City Council. There's, um, there was legislation pending to fully decriminalize um, prostitution in the District of Columbia. It was a heated hearing. I watched some of it. I've never seen the likes of it, I've got to tell you. How long was it? 14 hours? 14 hours. 14 hours, and we were obviously testifying in opposition to the bill. But there are lots of advocacy organizations um, that support full decriminalization. And I've got to tell you, I think that is, as Jane said, I think that is deeply, deeply dangerous. We meet so many young people who are being bought and sold. The idea that um, we might allow more of that um, is unfathomable to me. And I would just add, too, that even the young people that we work with, because we mentioned that we work with people whether or not there's that force, fraud, or coercion, so we see equal amounts of PTSD, anxiety, disassociation, whether or not it's consensual. So they think, the other side thinks you can draw this line and consensual is okay and non-consensual is not but we're not seeing any difference in the psychological side effects. The idea effects. of choice doesn't really exist for a victim. Um, and also what the, uh, what the decrim movement is doing, it's not countering the level of trauma and the complexity of trauma that a victim um, may experience that has different layers. 